YouTube is kind of becoming a battleground for in-house debates among Christian apologists and just the debates that we have amongst ourselves. And among those debates would be uh, the debate over the proper way in which we ought to approach religious epistemology. Uh, you know, under just what circumstances is it that our beliefs in general and our religious beliefs in particular are appropriately held? Uh, when are they rational? And major Christian apologetics channels are defending different perspectives on that. So Cameron Bertuzzi over on Capturing Christianity has had some prominent guests on uh, explaining and defending reformed epistemology. Jordan Hampton over with uh, the Analytic Christian is having some, uh, some high profile guests over there who defend a more phenomenal conservatism. Uh, Eli Ayala uh, over at Revealed Apologetics has had plenty of high-profile guests defending presuppositionalism on his channel. Uh, but one thing that's kind of bugged me is that, to my knowledge, no one is defending the one position that I think is correct, classical evidentialism. Uh, also known as classical foundationalism. So today we're going to try to rectify that situation. And while I've defended classical foundationalism on this channel before today, today I'm just going to bring on a highly qualified scholar, uh, John DePoe. Uh, his name shouldn't be new to anyone who watches my videos regularly. I cite him quite often. I've benefited a lot from his work, and uh, so I'm just so thankful that he is on today. Uh, John DePoe is the head of the Schools of Logic and Rhetoric at Kingdom Preparatory Academy. He's the author of numerous scholarly articles on epistemology and philosophy of religion, and he is also the co-editor of the excellent volume, Debating Christian Religious Epistemology. Incidentally, I think that's probably the best introduction to this debate, so if you have any interest uh, in this debate, then I would strongly recommend that you pick up that book. So without further ado, welcome onto the channel, Dr. DePoe. How are you doing today? I'm good. Thanks for inviting me, and thanks for that very, very generous introduction, and really glad to hear you promoting uh, the book, which uh, Tyler McNabb and I, the two editors of that, really wanted that book to be something for the interested layman, probably with a little bit of background knowledge in, in the subject, can pick up learn a lot about the importance of this debate. And so you'll get, of course, my perspective and uh, four others. So it's not a, a one-sided book at all. And for people that want to really get into these debates, it's a great place, I think, to start. Absolutely. You know, that's awesome. Before we kind of dive into the questions, are there any projects that you're working on that you'd like to share with us? Uh, anything that you want to tell us about? Well, I, I have a few things I'm working on. I'm not sure if I'm ready to share much about it yet because there's a few tentative things in, in, in the work. But um, my scholarship moves at, a, at what I think of as a slow and steady pace. Uh, in my the position I'm at is not in a high institution of higher education. Uh, I still have time to do some research and writing, and uh, I certainly have a bunch of ideas that I want to keep promoting. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I don't have quite the the time and resources that I used to have to dedicate to this. Um, so, so keep your eyes peeled. I may have some 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 news on uh, the epistemology of religion front um, in the next maybe a month or so. We'll see. Great. Well, I'm excited for that. Okay, well, let's kind of dive into this uh, discussion here. So when we're talking about the correct epistemology of religion, maybe it's just helpful to get an overview of, you know, what's epistemology in the first place and why is it important? Yeah, I think uh, that, that's, a, that's a great place to start. Epistemology, it really wants to study and analyze um, really all the things related to knowledge. Um, so what does it mean to know something and, and what does it mean for, a, a for a person to hold a belief? I mean, even the question of what our beliefs themselves could fall under the purview of epistemology. But I think the biggest questions that guide the whole project would be, um, what are the correct standards and practices for acquiring knowledge? And then you could even add to that, do we meet those standards? What would it take for us to actually have to acquire knowledge about things that matter to us? Great. And why would you say that that's important? Because I've had some people who are friends of mine and they say that epistemology is kind of a waste of time. Well, knowledge, you know, is powerful. You know, that that's a, a slogan that uh, is also true. And so when people talk about having knowledge, uh, 
at is an important claim. And if they do, in fact, have knowledge, then it is worth listening to. Um, the problem, of course, is that competing views and competing ideas, especially where it matters, uh, have conflicting claims about what they truly know to be true. Um, so th there's an important part of this that I would say is a uh, key part of the public affairs, the, the debate about public affairs. So things like whether it's about tax policy, climate change, um, and of course, even in apologetics that we make claims about what we know to be the case. Um, I think that all of that is, is crucially important, but I think beyond even these debates that have to do with public affairs and, and knowledge claims made by experts and others, I also think that it's really important as we think about what, what, what would be responsible for us to say about what we know and how we know that. Um, speaking on a Christian apologetics channel, we'll talk about things like, is it really appropriate for us to talk about uh, I know that there is a God, or um, to say things like, we know that Jesus claimed to be uh, the Messiah, um, or that we know that Jesus had this self-understanding of, him, of himself as being the Messiah. These would all be things that, once again, we all put under the heading of knowledge, and that's, that's really important. I also think something that we may get into a little bit um, later is even other related notions like being justified in believing. Uh, having justification for a belief, um, that we can also recognize that there's a difference between knowing something and being justified and believing something. And that can be very helpful in looking at, for instance, people that we disagree with. We can understand how somebody may have justification for believing something false, um, which is different than saying, of course, they know it. And I, I think having some of these conceptual resources to understand one another is also really important for epistemology. Great. Yeah, I really like that answer. So, yeah, you kind of began touching on this next question here, but uh, what is the concept of epistemic justification? Because there are a lot of philosophers that will say that justification, it's not required for knowledge. Uh, so... Uh, particularly Alvin Plantinga, I think he said it's neither necessary nor sufficient. So would you say justification really is necessary for knowledge? And if it is, then why? Yes. I, so just to put all my cards up front, I absolutely think that justification is required for knowledge. Um, but it's not sufficient for knowledge either. So justification seems to be a, a concept about belief that would say, um, that would imply that you, that a person who has a justified belief has a good reason to believe it. Now, unpacking what exactly that means, that's sort of the, the view from 10,000 feet up. That's, that seems to capture, I think, the intuition of being justified and believing something. You know, people make all kinds of, uh, or I should put it this way, people believe all kinds of things. Uh, there are people that, that might think that it will rain tomorrow because they read it um, from, you know, their uh, horoscope or something like this. Um, somebody else might think that it will rain tomorrow because they heard, uh, you know, a meteorologist, you know, report that. Um, both people may don't seem to both have good reasons to believe. So I think that having a good reason to believe would be closer, of course, to the meteorologist uh, basing your belief on a meteorologist who says um, it's going to rain because he has a he, he's an expert in a field of knowledge that is connected to making those kinds of claims accurately or with at least some degree of accuracy. Um, whereas somebody who thinks that it'll rain tomorrow, perhaps because uh, uh, they read it in their horoscope or they you know went to a fortune teller and they had a tarot card reading that somehow said it would rain tomorrow. Those practices seem to have no connection whatsoever to the reality of whether it will rain or not tomorrow. And so even when the horoscope or the tarot cards happen to land on true beliefs, those seem to just be by accident. Those just seem to be random. And when the meteorologist is wrong about the weather, um, it's not that um, his whole discipline and studies and, and tools that he used to predict the weather are, are completely disconnected from truth. It's just they're not infallible, that they have a fallible connection to truth. And so we seem to value, in many cases, just being justified in believing much more than just having true beliefs. Um, 
I think that a lot of times we would want to be, we would want to hone the tools that help us as individuals to be justified in, in believing things, as opposed to just, you know, being lucky individuals who just happen to pick up true beliefs. Um, another way in which I think to, to come around to the bigger question about how this is related to knowledge, um, I think to claim to know something and, the, and to claim to be justified in believing something, those are, are concepts that seem to say that individual is in a position to have something beyond just a hunch or a lucky guess or um, just a, a random belief, that that belief has a higher status. Now, that higher status is, I think, having a connection to truth in some way. And so I think that what you have with, um, what you have here is, uh, why, why does knowledge require justification? Because it seems like for an individual to know something, they need to have some basis for that belief. It can't just be um, a stray, arbitrary, you know, disconnected, random kind of belief. So a couple of thought experiments that can probably explain that a lot better than what I just did. Um, there's a philosopher um, named Laurence Bonjour, and he gave this great thought experiment that has been widely discussed and um, among epistemologists. And it's this uh, thought experiment with a man named Norman. And he wants you to imagine that Norman has the capacity for, for acquiring true beliefs through clairvoyance. Uh, clairvoyance is like, you know, where you know the truth of something without being present there. So, um, but Norman has never exercised this power of clairvoyance, and he doesn't really know anything even about clairvoyance himself, but, but he possesses the, this ability. So, like, you're supposed to imagine one morning Norman's, like, eating his breakfast or something, and it just pops into his head. It just occurs to him that the president is in New York City today. Now, Norman hasn't been following the news. He's not particularly political or the kind of person to follow the whereabouts of the president. But what has happened, unbeknownst to Norman, is that suddenly his clairvoyant power kicks in for the very first time and reports the truth that the president is, in fact, in New York City. And that power um, gives him now that, that true belief. So the question that uh, bonjour pitches to the audiences. Well, does he does he know it? Does he is he justified in believing that the president is in New York City? And most, in fact, I would say everybody who encounters the thought experiment wants to say, no, he doesn't know it. He, he he's not justified in believing that. Uh, what what's going? What he's missing is some awareness of why the president is in New York City. Like there's no basis. There's no underlying reason he has to think that the president is actually there. Um, what would, and one way to think about all of that is to say, what would be the difference between that belief being caused by this um, clairvoyant power and being true? And what would be the difference between that and him just, you know, having some kind of random belief pop into his head, but through some kind of uh, arbitrary causal conditions that are completely disconnected from the truth, he wouldn't know the difference. It would look the exact same to him. So um, it seems like what's missing is something that would tell Norman, well, from my perspective, this belief has something more going for it in the truth category than just a stray hunch. And one more thought experiment is uh, one from Keith Lehrer, and he has this great event that he calls Mr. True Temp. And Mr. True Temp is an individual who, and you always have to go with these philosophers when they have these thought experiments, but he, he imagines that somehow uh, Mr. True Temp had somebody implant a device in his head, and he has no idea this, this ever took place. But the device that gets implanted into his head causes him to directly form true beliefs about the ambient air temperature around him. So... Um, let's say the day after the surgery is over and he once again has no idea that there was a surgery and how they, you know, these, these tricksters who pull this off are really good. Um, he's walking around and it just occurs to him. He has no reason. He has no basis or reason or understanding why it just occurs to him. Huh, it's 74.5 degrees in this room. Does he know that it's 74.5 degrees in the room? 
once again, I think the intuition for most of us say, well, he doesn't know it. Um, at least not the, the first time. He could probably come to have knowledge of this if, let's say, he starts taking notes each time and he realizes he's got this great track record and he's getting it 100% right all the time. Maybe then you can start talking about him having a reason now to trust this uh, belief forming mechanism. But right now he has no idea that he's that he has this device in his head. It just seems once again, just like a stray hunch or a random happening. And for that reason, most of us are inclined to say, yeah, that that doesn't seem to count as knowledge. Knowledge requires something more. And so the way that I've articulated this in some of uh, my writings is to say that knowledge requires justification and justification requires at least two kinds of conditions. One of those is a subjective condition, which I, I would say the condition says that whatever else justification is, it needs to be something from the subject's perspective that helps them to see what that belief has going for it. And then the second condition I call the objective connection uh, condition. And the objective condition is this idea that it doesn't just have to seem to be um, a good thing for this belief to have this, but it also needs to objectively be the case that uh, the belief is in some way connected to truth. And that might be in a very strong way, what we would call logical entailment, um, or it could be in a, in a weaker way, I think. It could even include things like uh, probabilist connections and, and some things along those lines. So that's a very long-winded answer. So I hope uh, some of that was, was good for you. Um, but um, but that, that's kind of my, my quick take on justification and knowledge. No, that's great. I love it. I, I've always kind of just felt like to throw away the justification condition on knowledge is to sort of throw away the thing that yeah, the, motivated. Real fast on, on, the on this, I think that one me. of the big so I, I really appreciate that. things that people uh, have so, done is there have been some, uh, well, let me, let, me, let me skip to this other thought I had, which is that particularly, especially the subjective condition, this idea that from my perspective, it needs to make sense. And this is really when you talk about folks like um, like Plantinga and, and the reformed epistemology crowd. Um, one of the things that happens when you say that it doesn't have to make sense from my perspective is suddenly now epistemology is being done from a perspective that is not yours. And I've always found it to be a very unhelpful way to do epistemology because I don't get to practice epistemology from the third person point of view. I have to practice it from my point of view. And so if you're doing a theory of epistemology that does not get applied to how does this work out from my perspective, then you're doing a whole theory of epistemology that nobody in practice can apply to themselves. And it seems like, then what's the point? I thought that one of the reasons I was doing philosophy was as a pursuit of wisdom and wanting to understand myself. And it seems like that approach just seems to say, well, we need to give up on that and just sort of make this all uh, kind of a an analysis of knowledge from the third person and 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 that ends up being completely unhelpful um, when it comes to thinking about your own justification and your own knowledge yeah, yeah. i agree i think planting has even gone as far as to say god himself can't do it from the first person perspective and that seemed very strange to me uh, so, yeah, when we're talking about justification, then there are these different, well, there's something called the structure of justification. And people kind of talk about, well, w what is it that justification looks like? And you've got these different kind of visual models. I don't know if you want to briefly go through those, but I know basically you're going to hold to a type yeah. of foundationalism. Well, foundationalism is so, you know, the tell us maybe approach what to that is justification. And, why we and if you've got my view, it's also then the approach to knowledge where there are basically two kinds of beliefs structurally. There are those that you would say are non-inferential, and then there are inferential beliefs. And non-inferential beliefs are those that would make up, so to speak, the foundation. And those non-inferential beliefs then uh, would be the basis by which you infer inferential beliefs. And so um, one, one feature of foundationalism is that there are no circular there's no circular justification so um it's a you could put it this way that justification is one way this is for a first layer of inferred beliefs 
then that layer of inferred, inferred beliefs could be the basis for a second layer of inferred beliefs, but you can't then have the second layer be a basis for the first again. Um, it would be, that would create a loop. And so um, circular reasoning is something most foundationalists are very, uh, very much against. And I think com commonsensically, it makes a lot of sense why you don't want circles in your, in your reasoning. Um, and so that's one of the big motivations that would make it different from a coherentist uh, point of view, where they do have the idea that justification works in two directions or in multiple directions. So that belief A can be the basis for belief B and belief B can also be the basis for belief A. That's the sort of thing that I would reject outright. Um, so the, um, so that's basically what, what I would say foundationalism is in a very broad sense. Great. Yeah. I, I always thought that like a rejection of circular reasoning just kind of comes from this underlying intuition that we ought not just be assuming that our beliefs yeah, are true. The, I so think that's that kind of the you could say that there, um, there's a what few, would you say might be different the ways to why we should this. Be um, so one of them I think is actually just experiential. Um, there are beliefs that, that I have that I, I, I am justified in believing, but it doesn't seem like I'm basing that on any other belief. So the kinds of examples that we kind of pull out that tend to be pretty safe are like examples of, of being in pain. You know, if I'm having a, a searing pain uh, experience and then I believe that I'm in pain, it's hard to find another belief that is the basis for that. I mean, if I'm sitting in front of a mirror and I'm like screaming in pain and wincing, and if I were to say, well, I, I believe that I'm in pain because I'm observing my own behavior and people who tend to wince and cry out in pain tend to be in pain, I just say that's just comical, right? To think that you're inferring your own pain by your pain behavior. Um, it just seems like, a belief like this just, you know, is foundational that there is no other belief it is based on. It's non-inferential in that sense. Um, so experience seems to confirm foundationalism in many instances. Um, I'd also say that it's, uh, there's a, what you might call a conceptual regress argument for foundationalism. And, a, and this is different from another regress argument that's often used. But the idea behind a conceptual regress is that you can't keep, if you want to have a definition of justification, it seems like you can't define one justified belief by just saying, well, that comes from another justified belief. And then where does that justification comes from? Well, that comes from the justification of another belief. At some point, you need to have introductory level justification. And so if we have this idea, if, if justification itself were always defined in terms of being justified through other beliefs, it seems like we would actually never arrive at a basic understanding of what justification itself is. And so since we, I would say, since we do have an idea of what justification is, and since uh, it doesn't seem to go on conceptually forever, it, we need to have a starting point for justification. So defining in a foundationalist structure, non-inferential justification in, an, in the way that, um, that I do, it actually provides a basic way to understand what justification is. And then we can say that non uh, that inferential, inferential justification is defined in terms of being justified now from non-inferential beliefs. And so the concept of justification is not going to end up being circular. Um, and then finally, real, the, the other one that is often brought out is this idea of the, the regress argument. It seems like the options on the regress argument make it such that if we have any knowledge or any justification whatsoever, you got to have foundational beliefs. Uh, the options seem to be that the, the regress is stopped um, in an arbitrary way. Um, the idea is that it goes on, the, that a regress goes on infinitely in a line. And another idea is that it goes on infinitely in a circle. And so the, the best option is this idea that the regress is stopped in a non-arbitrary way. And so this idea of what I mean by a regress is just this idea of, let's say, um, how, do you, the way it's, how, how do you know that? So um, let's say uh, I want to... Uh, uh, that I believe that, um, you know, the, the San Antonio Spurs, my favorite team, 
are not going to win the NBA championship this year. I could spout off some reasons um, for that. And then some know that. And then I'd spout off more reasons. I know those reasons. And then you just keep the question is how long could that questioning go on? And so if it goes on and it stops just at some arbitrary point with some baseless point, then it would seem like everything it was built upon would also be baseless. So that seems like a bad option. If it went on infinitely in a line, um, that doesn't seem to work either um, for a few reasons. One is um, we don't have that many beliefs that the infinite, if it took an infinite number of beliefs to justify um, one belief, we don't have the ability to have that many beliefs. And we certainly may not have the ability to comprehend all those beliefs. And we certainly don't seem to have the ability to beliefs the one. So there, there seem to be a lot of problems with going that route. If it's going to be an infinite number of beliefs, but um, in a circle or infinite number of reasons, but the, in, the infinity is not created by an infinite number of beliefs, but, but just by going in a circle and repeating, then we fall into circular reasoning. That doesn't seem to help us. So it seems like the best way to stop this regress of reasons is to say that at some point you reach a, a stopping point and that stopping point is not arbitrary, but a properly justified place to stop that then is a good foundation for all the other reasons to stand upon. Yeah, I really like that, and I think that that's a powerful argument. But when the question can then be raised, but then how do these you know basic beliefs, these foundational beliefs, these non-inferentially justified beliefs, how are they themselves supposed to be justified? And so you kind of follow Bertrand Russell and Richard Fumerton and these kinds of philosophers. I think and the direct acquaintance um, is this idea for of basic beliefs the and what you would call mind a direct acquaintance. An immediate so maybe you can tell us what, what is a direct object. acquaintance and, and, and kind this of how does awareness that justify is a basic not, What we'd say is non-inferential. Um, it's it's immediate in that it's not mediated through another concept or through another belief. So direct acquaintance is just that it's the point of con contact really. And I think this is the proper starting place for any epistemology. Um, and it, it just seems to me that uh, that that just seems like the, the right place for all to begin, where your mind makes content reality. Um, so direct acquaintance is, is that place of contact. Now, I don't think that it would be kind of naive to say that anything that you have that immediate direct acquaintance with suddenly turns into knowledge. I actually don't think that direct acquaintance is by itself a means of knowledge, at least in or, or justification. And I, what I mean by that is that it's really what I would think of as a metaphysical relationship, not a, not intrinsically or not specifically a, an epistemic relationship by itself. So one of the things that I think is really uh, helpful about this, coming back to a point I said earlier about the conceptual regress, is that if you can explicate justification, epistemic justification, without having to, re to have recourse to other concepts in epistemology, that actually would then give you an analysis of something epistemic in non-epistemic terms. And that it would be a good thing because you're not having any kind of conceptual circularity. Um, to give one quick example of that, there are a lot of theories of justification that are justified in believing something just so long as you don't have, you meet all these conditions, whatever their conditions are, plus there's no, there are what they call no defeaters for the belief. A defeater just would be some kind of justified reason to disbelieve it. Well, in that no defeaters clause, they're actually committing themselves to a kind of conceptual circularity because they're defining justification by using justification in their definition. So you never really get to the to the rock bottom element of what they mean by justification if they're giving an analysis of that concept. By analyzing justification in terms of direct acquaintance, this metaphysical relationship, it then tells us what justification is and we don't fall into conceptual circularity. 
So on my approach, which I follow Richard Fromerton, which shouldn't be a surprise, he was my dissertation advisor, and I took many epistemology courses with him and, and enjoyed his company quite a bit in, in discussing epistemology. Uh, I follow his model in that I think justification comes from three from possessing three types of direct acquaintances. And so um, by standing in these three metaphysical relationships, it creates epistemic justification. And so the, the, the model here also follows a correspondence theory of truth. So I'm, I'm going to take a quick digress here about the correspondence theory of truth. Uh, the correspondence theory of truth says that there are basically three elements that come into there being something being true. There's a truth bearer, which would be the proposition um, or the belief. Um, some people have different views about this, but whatever linguistically or conceptually bears the truth. There is the truth maker, which is usually considered to be the fact of the matter, the reality that um, is true or sorry, the reality that is, it's truth is not a property of reality. It's a property of propositions. So the reality that obtains, that exists. Um, and then, so you've got the truth maker, or sorry, the truth bearer, the truth maker, and then the correspond, the relation of correspondence that holds between the truth bearer and the truth maker. The thing that's, that the relationship that says the one thing corresponds to the other. Um, since propositions are not, uh, reality in the same way that reality is, and reality is not propositions, there has to be some relationship that, that says the, that the one corresponds to the other. So on my and Richard's approach to justi justification, the idea is that you have direct acquaintance with three kinds of things, and these three things model this correspondence theory of truth. Instead of the truth bearer, we would say that you have direct acquaintance with the thought or the belief that we, and in philosophical terms, we'll say that P, and P just stands for the proposition there. Um, the second thing, instead of the truth um, maker, that fact or, or of reality, we would say that you have, um, that you are directly acquainted with fact, that P. And then instead of, um, just the, the correspondence, we would throw in now that you would have to have direct acquaintance with the relation of correspondence that your thought and the fact um, stand in. And you need to have all three of those things. Just possessing um, one of those is not enough to give you knowledge so or justification. So you need to have all three, uh, all three elements. And when you stand in those three relationships, um, that's what gives you justified beliefs. Yeah, I like that. And it's so it's easy to see why that would give you justification for the belief, because that's just that's everything that makes your belief true. It, it's it all right the, there. The, this you idea of the got it. objective so I, and subjective the, I love that criteria it, I mentioned it earlier that satisfied the truth beautifully of the belief in and this. And that's what I that. also so I find really so powerful, attractive about this view um, model is that of it, non it's in so many different views of epistemic justification. First, they don't satisfy often they don't satisfy both criteria. Some have this subjective awareness but lack a kind of objective connection to truth. Others have this objective connection to truth, but lack a subjective awareness. And then even, uh, you know, some others realize that their view had one or the other, and their fix to it is to just cobble on to their view another component that is just completely uh, an add-on um, to it to give that extra component. On the approach that I'm describing, you get both the objective connection to truth and the subjective assurance of truth without it being some kind of ad hoc, messy looking, you know, cobbled together system of epistemology. It's just a beautiful outworking of very simple approach. So you get the subjective awareness because you're directly acquainted with all the elements. So if you're directly acquainted with all the elements, then you've got subjective awareness. You, you, you have, in some sense, I like to use the metaphor that you see what the belief has going for it. But it also has the objective connection to truth because it's it's got the three components that are just like a correspondence theory of truth. And uh, so if it's got the three elements that, 
that would mirror a correspondence theory of truth, it's got something going on. You know, it, it satisfies the structure that would be, once again, in the category of truth, as opposed to just being a hunch or a random uh, guess or um, feeling good about the belief. Great. So we've got the, the theory on the table. It all sounds good, but in philosophy, battles don't ever get won just by laying out the view. There's always the objections. So there are a lot of objections to classical foundationalism. Uh, I had a handful of them here to ask you, and we may not even get through the ones that I have here. But uh, probably as I read through the literature on this, um, I encounter one objection to classical foundationalism more often than any other objection, and I have frankly never understood it, but it traces back to Alvin Plantinga, and he argues that classical foundationalism is self-refuting. It says he says it either it doesn't meet its own criteria, or you can't um, infer it from any beliefs that do well, meet this, this it's strong not, criteria. People really like these self-refuting arguments. So, and I, and I, I know you've written a whole paper on this, this but. And it's a great you know, paper. One of the, the most it, celebrated way, but, um, self-refuting How do you answer that you Think about from a, a nice lesson, actually, from the history of 20th century analytic philosophy um, is logical positivism, this idea that came out of the Vienna Circle. Um, logical positive, positivism was this idea that a belief or a thought, an idea, was meaningful if and only if it was either analytic, which is like it was true by its definition or true by um, like it was meaning, the meaning was self-evident in it, or if um, it could be confirmed empirically through the five senses or through scientific methods. Um, logical positivism is one of those views that we can point to in philosophy and say we, it was tried, it was popular, and it was buried. Uh, one of the reasons actually is because a lot of science ended up not being able to be, satisfy logical positivism and that turned out into a problem. But one of the things that was very appealing was in terms of the criticisms was this idea that, well, can you, is logical positivism, is it true by definition? Is it an analytic truth? Well, no, it's not that. Okay, can you scientifically and empirically confirm logical positivism? Well, no, you, you can't. So by its own definition, it's meaningless. And so um, it ended up, one of the reasons it died was because it couldn't meet its own standard. It was self-refuting in a way. Well, um, these arguments just are so nice when you can pull them out because when, when you see them clearly, it just shows what's obviously wrong with the view. So the pro so Plantinga has said this about classical foundationalism, but his argument is not quite as nice and clean and neat as it would be for logical positivism. So logical positivism ended up making it such that its own view couldn't even be intelligible. So how, how is this supposed to apply to classical foundationalism? Well, Plantinga would say, and he's done this in a lot of papers, so it depends on which one you look at, but he'd look at some different criteria that uh, classical foundationalists have set, have laid out, like is, is classical foundationalism self-evident? Well, no, it's not self-evident. Is it um, incorrigible? Is it a belief uh, or set of beliefs such that um, if you held them, you could not be, you would not be in a correctable position about them. Well, no, it doesn't, it's not that. Is it, does it meet a standard for infallibility? And, and he would go through all these sort of standards that classical foundationalists have said about non-inferential beliefs, those, those basic beliefs. And of course, it never met any of those standards. And then he would just, by the way, throw in there something like, and you couldn't infer it from those beliefs. Therefore, it doesn't meet its own standard. Well, the problem with this is that one, no classical foundationalist ever thought that classical foundationalism was a basic belief. So pointing out it didn't meet any of the standards for basicality or for proper basicality was just a non-starter. Like nobody ever thought that. But the, the second problem then is then his, dis, the, so he spent all of his time usually talking about those things and then just threw in and you can't infer it. Well, that's where Classical foundationalists would say, whoa, let's pump the brakes there, buddy. Um, what do you mean you can't infer it? Um, this has been arguably the most dominant view in, in epistemology from Western civilization. 
when you read St. Augustine in, in his book Against the Academicians, he refutes them in a way that is very clearly a classical foundationalist structure. Um, so you see this in St. Augustine. You see this in people like John Locke. Um, I would even argue that you see this in, in the work of C.S. Lewis. This is, this is the structure of epistemology that was kind of accepted by, in general, something like classical foundation, foundationalism was accepted with some variation among all these different folks. They all have very different reasons and arguments for the, that justify the theory itself. And I wouldn't just point to historical figures, but uh, the, the theory itself is alive and well today um, by some of the, the most influential epistemologists that are still out there, not just my dissertation advisor, Richard Fummerton. Uh, Lawrence Bonjour uh, has been very influential in promoting this after leaving coherentism to adopt more of a classical foundationalist structure. Um, Timothy and Lydia McGrew have written some excellent work on this. Um, and, uh, and there are many others that I could just keep going and going. Uh, the point is that, you know, you can't just dismiss and say, and this is how the argument would go in planning his papers, is he would say, I can't see any reason why it's true. Therefore, there must not be any good reasons for why it's true. Well, if that counts as a good argument, then we could say we, we could write this for every paper. You know, I could just say atheism is false because I can't see any good reasons for atheism. Therefore, atheism is false. I would I, mean, I don't think many atheists would find that very convincing. And so classical foundationalists were not very impressed that Planning had just said, well, I'm not convinced by any of their reasons. So their reasons must not be any good. Well, please explain. We'd like you to unpack that and we could engage that a little more deeply then. Yeah, I, I've always thought that and his argument was kind of, in a sense, question begging against arguments for classical. And a couple of uh, it just, it folks that I think that are very much arguments that I think could in be inferred from, from that, that they just must not this. be any so good. There's a section in a book uh, without Randall dealing Rouser with those arguments. It would just be I think it's called theology and search for foundations, where he, he explores this and my counter argument to Planning and essentially says, okay, Defoe is right, Planning was wrong. Um, but he then, go, but that doesn't mean Depot's view is right. It just means that planning a self-refutation argument is wrong. Then he goes on to support planning for other reasons. Um, my my colleague Tyler McNabb uh, is also convinced that you know the self-refutation argument is a bad argument for rejecting classical foundationalism. So um, I think that if as people have looked at this, I think that it sounds nice. It has some rhetorical appeal, but when you really dig into the details, it's just not very convincing. Yeah, self-refutation arguments are easy to dish out, but they're also usually pretty easy to answer, in my experience. Uh, so, probably the most common objection that gets raised against uh, classical foundationalism, maybe not uh, like not among people like Plantinga, but kind of just out there and among other philosophers, would be uh, what's known as the Salarzian dilemma. This kind of dilemma that goes back to uh, Wilfred Sellers, and he basically argued that you know whatever it is that you're uh, identifying as the foundation for knowledge, it's either going to be conceptual and propositional, and so it's going to require justification, or if it's not conceptual and not propositional, then it's yeah, um, and it's, just, it's like nothing. And I'll quickly say Wilfred Sellers is. A that. Fascinating so, philosophy. You, you and, argue and that very interesting the direct acquaintance theory from that a, it an actually, earlier generation it doesn't face um, this dilemma. So lot, how would I have you get a lot of respect that? for sellers. Uh, with that said, um, I do think this argument can be met. Um, so the as you said, the dilemma is, is that what do you do with those non-inferentially justified beliefs? Where do they get their justification? If they get their justification from something that is propositional and conceptual, as you pointed out then it seems like that itself needs justification. But if you get it from something that's non-propositional and non-conceptual, then how does that transmit justification? The, the answer on, on the approach that I take is to take that second horn of the dilemma and to show how you can get 
prop how you can get justification from something that is itself non-propositional and non-conceptual. And that just is pointing out that that's another motivation for why I think direct acquaintance in itself is not epistemic in its nature. It is just a metaphysical relationship. It's just a relation between the mind and its immediate object of awareness. And so by st so that's how you actually generate justification out of something that is non-conceptual and non-propositional by being directly acquainted with those three different things, directly acquainted with the, the basic belief, being directly acquainted with the reality or the fact that um, it corresponds to, and then being directly acquainted with the relation corresponding to belief and the fact or the reality that it, that it um, represents. And so, um, the direct acquaintances themselves are non-conceptual, they are non-propositional, but it seems like when you understand that, that layout that you can see how they can confer justification. So it's a nice way to get the dilemma by being able to get justification out of a series of, of relations that are non-propositional and non-conceptual in their nature. Great. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I think that, that, I think you're right. I think that's the perfect way of uh, avoiding the dilemma. So basically the upshot is just that being acquainted with something isn't the same as having the, the corresponding belief. You just, you're having the acquaintance with it. And so that's why it's capable of uh, conferring the justification. Uh, yeah. Another objection. This one I think is kind of big with uh, like Ted Poston and uh, Ernest Sosa will bring up this question that's, kind of in a literature known as the problem of the speckled hen. And the idea here seems to be uh, that you can be directly acquainted with complicated facts. So like uh, maybe maybe like your bookshelf over there. Like if you're having the visual experience of your bookshelf, um, you're, you should be directly acquainted with the fact of how many books you have on there. But it seems like there's no way to have a justified belief about the number of books that's on the bookshelf, despite being directly acquainted so with that, it. That's the, and that's if the direct objection. acquaintance, um, that's, that's what you need for justification, the way, then the you, put it, you, you should is very have a justified well said. belief about the number um, of books and on I think the shelf, that it but steps you don't. Right into so the, the very, the, theory is the, just the, no the good, problem right? with it is that it seems to assume that all you need is one direct acquaintance, just direct acquaintance with the fact, or just direct acquaintance with the reality. But the problem is... Um, that's not my theory, and that that isn't the theory of most classical foundationalists. Um, and on the the view that I espouse, it's not just one direct acquaintance; it's it's the three. So not just being directly acquainted with the reality, but being directly acquainted with your belief. And then the important one is being directly acquainted with with that relation of correspondence that holds between them. And so while I might be directly acquainted, I don't know, I didn't count my books behind me, but let's say uh, there was like fifty two books back there. Um, I, I may be directly acquainted with 52 books right now, but I wouldn't, I'm not in a position to be, and I, and I can be directly acquainted with the belief that there are 52 books there, but I can't see how they correspond. Like that doesn't, there, there's not an, a, a direct awareness of how the belief matches with that reality. Um, you know, there's some interesting work that some philosophers have done they, they, on things that they call phenomenal concepts. And these would be concepts that we have that categorize our, our reality. And so um, we probably have a phenomenal for like um, fate, the, the, the sides of, uh, of, a, of a die. So like a, in a game, board game, you know, if you have multiple dice that you roll, um, we can probably, most of us, without, in, without inference, without counting them up, can see that when the five side comes up, we just immediately see five. We can recognize that because we have a, the argument is we have a phenomenal concept to recognize that that corresponds with five. Um, most of us don't have the ability to have a phenomenal concept of corresponding with large numbers of diverse things. One interesting idea is that maybe, you know, if, if people, the savants that are in, uh, that have been characterized in movies and, and books um, like Of Mice and Men or, or uh, Rain Man or things like this, 
maybe what's going on when they can, when somebody like drops like a, a container of paper clips and they can and, and they can immediately infer that there are like 103 paper clips there or something like that maybe they actually have this ability to recognize that correspondence between them we can only form you know these we 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 have direct contact with that visual experience of of that reality but what we don't have direct acquaintance with is how that corresponds to any belief and so once again maybe these savants maybe they just have this uncanny un you know unusual ability to see the correspondence between those kinds of experiences and a propositional belief in a way the rest of us can't so i think that's what what's going on in the speckled hen case is just that most of us just don't have that ability to see the correspondence between a, a propositional belief and the re reality that we are directly acquainted with when it gets that complicated and complex. Yeah, I think that's a that's a good way of explaining that. So what about a charge? Here's, here's one that comes up. Uh, I think Michael Bergman has made this argument that direct acquaintance doesn't get you out of circularity. So Michael Bergman has actually argued, uh, I think it was his, uh, I forget which paper it was. I think it was externalism and circularity. But uh, he argued that direct acquaintance itself is actually a circular theory of justification because uh, we can always ask the question, well, how do you know there's such a thing as a direct acquaintance? And the answer that people like yourself and Richard Fulton well, have given is, I can is, see what, well, I'm what he's getting acquainted at. with that. Um, I don't, goes, I don't blame ah, him so for, for I caught trying. you. You're in circular um, reasoning, so I you think can't the, object to when the we idea that we would say um, is one. What, what do you think of that? Direct acquaintance. It, it is that it, it is the place of the, of contact that takes place between the mind and reality. This is metaphysically about as basic as it gets. This is like the starting point. I would say for epistemology and metaphysics uh, is this place where the mind makes contact with reality. So the question is, how do you justify, explain, understand something that is the, the foundational starting point for arguably for metaphysics and epistemology? Well, I can't be aware of direct acquaintance except through direct acquaintance. That's what the theory says even, right? If I could be aware of it in some other way, my theory would be wrong. So I'm in this awkward position where I would say is that I know or I'm aware of direct acquaintance because I'm directly acquainted with it. Now, here's the, the, the thing though, is that I wouldn't say that um, my theory of direct acquaintance is the basis for direct acquaintance. What I would say is that I, have this experience of direct acquaintance through being directly acquainted with it, but I have formulated epistemic and metaphysical theory out of that experience. So conceptually, there is no circularity. It's not that out of this theory, I have now concocted the theory. It's that out of the experience, I have analyzed that and, and reflected on it to co conceptualize it with this theory. But it's not as if uh, the theory is the basis for the theory. Um, the other thing that I, I like to point out is something a little bit more indirect, which is that suppose there, there were no, there was nothing that we were directly acquainted with. Let's say direct acquaintance did not there, there, there was an, it was impossible or there was some there was no direct acquaintance at all. So if you remember, direct acquaintance is this like immediate awareness of reality, that contact that the mind has with reality. And it's unmediated, both in terms, it's not inferential, but it's also not mediated through other concepts. So if there was no direct acquaintance, that would mean that all, all of our beliefs would be inferred from other beliefs, which would be inferred from other beliefs, which would be inferred from other beliefs. There'd be no starting point. It would go on forever. Um, the other thing is that you could never think about something without it being thought through another concept or another belief. So you would you would always be infinitely distant away from your belief from even understanding the meaning of the beliefs and concepts you have. So what I would say is that since we do have thoughts that we understand that we have um, there is meaning that we comprehend in thought, 
it must it must take there must be some way that we have an, some immediate awareness of something otherwise if all beliefs were mediated through other beliefs then even that belief would be mediated through another and that would be mediated th through another and that would just go on forever in a way that would put us infinitely distant from everything we believe and since we're not infinitely distant from the meaning of all of our beliefs and since we're not infinitely inferring our all of our beliefs from other beliefs it seems to follow that we've got some immediate, non-inferential, um, not conceptually loaded um, awareness of something. And that, my friends, is what we call direct acquaintance. Yeah, really well put. Yeah, just kind of the way I answer that objection is I say, like, what, what I mean by circularity, the kind I'm trying to avoid is basically the sort of circularity where I'm effectively just assuming my belief. I'm inferring my belief from the belief I already hold. But in this case, we're inferring the belief that we have an acquaintance from just the acquaintance. So yeah, we're not inferring a belief from the belief. We're an analogy a belief from the acquaintance. I think, that we, I don't think there's anything circular in going on case. when we so study the human eye not circular in those other cases. It's just not evident why that, it should be circular you know, it in was, this case. When, I, well. when, we, when that was those a, first uh, biologists were looking at the human eye and discovered where you know the retina was and how the lens works and the corona and all these different parts of the eye, um, and they were using their very eyes to see it, it wasn't like there's some kind of circular reasoning going on. They were just using their eyes to understand what was going on in their own eyes. And this is the same thing I think. I think that's a good analogy with direct acquaintance is that, yes, I'm directly acquainted with direct acquaintance, but I'm using direct acquaintance to arrive at the theory of direct acquaintance. But it's not as if I used the theory of direct acquaintance to arrive at the theory of direct acquaintance. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, let's, All right, let's go ahead. So um, we're coming up here on about an hour. We had said that we could probably go up to an hour and 15 minutes. I've got two other questions that we do want to hit. Uh, do you think we have time to get into Michael Bergman's dilemma? All right, so Michael Bergman, in his book, Justification Without Awareness, spends the first half of the book developing this formidable dilemma for an internalist epistemology. And, you know, he's got extensive interactions with Fumerton and Fails and McGrew. And um, so, I mean, I, I give him a thumbs up for interacting so with our best voices. he starts off kind of where we started but, our um, conversation by saying that... Maybe you want to present sense, what is that dilemma, and then you've written a really good paper responding to that dilemma. About so, you know, explain what is his dilemma, is and then how do you get out of it? Justification requires the subject's, what he calls the subject's perspective... Uh, he, he says that it has this objection to externalism called the subject's perspective objection. And that internalism avoids that because it says justification has to do with something where the justification, um, is, there's something relevant about the justification that is aware, aware to the subject. Now, he, the sort of our overarching arc of his argument is that if internalism can make good on that, then it would be a superior or I don't know if maybe that's too strong. It would be, it would have a, an, a leg up on externalism. So his point is to say that nobody can satisfy the subject's perspective of, um, objection, that the subject's perspective actually implodes on itself. And so it's a, it, it seems like a, there's something to it, but when you really follow up on it, he thinks it's, it's going to fall apart. And so the way that he does this is says that you can, uh, if to meet the subject's perspective objection, you need to then say there's some some way in which your belief has uh, meets that. So he says it can meet that with strong awareness or with weak awareness. And the strong awareness would be in a, in a way of saying that you meet that. Uh, what what justifies your belief essentially is something that you could conceptually form formalize in terms of another belief. And that runs into some problems. Um, and I actually agree with his diagnosis of the strong awareness um, angle on this. 
So if you're an internalist and you say what my belief, my beliefs require um, internal justification, which means that, uh, which means that from my perspective, uh, I can see what those beliefs what justifies those beliefs. And you say, well, what does that mean? Well, that means I've got another belief that that tells me that that belief is justified for that reason. But then you're going to see that this leads to a regress because now you have belief. Well, how do you justify that one? Well, I've got to see that that belief is has a good reason that justifies it. And it just seems to, to go on. And, and the reason why you can't escape this one quite like the Salarzian one is because it seems like you this just what he calls a justification contributor. Whatever it is that makes the belief have the feature that overcomes the subject's perspective always seems to have to be conceptualized as another belief. So you start going down this route, it seems like you can't stop it. And it's even worse because as you try to explain all this, it actually it makes the, each belief compli- more and more complicated. So if you say it gets, I'll try not to use quite the same jargon, but it, it's, it's still pretty messy. So if you say like, well, belief one is justified because I believe that it has belief two as a part of it. And then you say, well, and then you have to say belief two is justified because of belief three, but each one of these things is nested inside the other. And so you end up with a belief, not just of infinite size, but also infinite complexity. And uh, you just can't meet that. So the other side of that is what you would call weak awareness or what he calls weak awareness and weak awareness then is where you try to stop that just that uh, that chain of, of justifying reasons for to answer the subject's perspective without conceptualizing it as a belief and doing it in, in a term in some kind of way that is less than full blown belief. And direct acquaintance would be, I think, the best way, of course, to answer this. That, uh, and and so um, I think that then the answer to this is very similar to uh, a problem that you get. There's a, a paper that Lewis Carroll, the author of Alice in Wonderland, um, he wrote the, some of these fascinating logical puzzles and, and epistemic puzzle papers, and he wrote this one about Achilles and the tortoise, and um, had to do with triangles. So I, I think, I believe that the, the puzzle was, um, how do you know that the, these two angles are equal to one another? Um, or that these two angles are of the equal length or, or equal, sorry, equal degree. And it says, well, because they're equal to one another. And then, um, the tortoise then asks Achilles, well, do you have to also believe that you believe that it has those features? And he says, yes. And then you have to believe that it, that you believe, and it just keeps getting once again, this kind of infinite regress. Well, the answer seems to, to, to all these kinds of regresses as an internalist seems to be, you, you just don't have to add another belief, adding another belief is what is the problem here that you're sending yourself off to the races each time you say the solution is for me to find another belief for me uh to say that that's what justifies it or gives me awareness of its justification and um and i'll just quickly add that just also seems outside of our usual experience as well um i don't think that's how we typically reason and think so once again if you go the direct acquaintance route um I'm, I seem to be able to answer the subject's perspective objection by saying that I'm directly acquainted with the three direct acquaintances, game over. You know, I have what it takes for the belief to be justified, and I have, in his terms, weak awareness, not because it's like substandard, but because it's not a propositional belief. I'm directly acquainted. It's about as close as the mind gets to it. So it's pretty good stuff, I think. Well, his answer to that is say, well, weak awareness just isn't strong enough. But I think... I find that, uh, I, I don't think that's correct. I think that the, even though he calls it weak and it could rhetorically be appealing for that reason, I think it gives you everything you could possibly want from the subject's perspective to say, to put you in a position to say what I believe has, uh, you know, what I'd call the epistemic goods going for it. it it's got, uh, in the case of, of correspond when you're directly acquainted with the correspondence between your belief and the reality, you've got everything you need to, to be confident that that's true. So um, adding on another belief 
actually sometimes complicates things and I think would actually could, could, could introduce more doubts. So I would even say the strong awareness option is not even ideal for that reason as well. Yeah, yeah, I like that. I think Bergman's whole argument kind of hinges on this unargued point that it's possible for somebody to have all three of those direct acquaintances, but then can just have this cognitive malfunction so that he can't, um, he can't see that uh, the acquaintances justify his belief. And he, he never argues for that assumption. And so I think, you know, y you're right to just, you know, reject it. Like, yeah, and that, that's if exactly if you're right. With the correspondence, it's, it almost how, how, back to how is it that a like cognitive malfunction is gonna where it almost seems you know, like what he must prevent you from seeing that the belief is justified without somehow mode, destroying like, the acquaintance. I really with just the have you directly acquainted with the one thing, but my the the view isn't one direct acquaintance, but all three. And when you have direct acquaintance with correspondence with the correspondence relation, it seems really hard to see how you could be directly acquainted with that. And somehow be, you know, in a place of like some kind of like radical cognitive dissonance where you don't see, you're not even in a position to see that the belief could be true. So I, I just find that, uh, once again, the, the thought experiment seems to be to, to, to fail as well. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. Do you do we have time to hit Williamson? All right. So Timothy Williamson, probably one of the most influential philosophers working today, <laughs> not an internalist, and he uh, gives an interesting argument. I believe it's in uh, Knowledge and Its Limits. So kind of he lays out his theory of knowledge uh, for knowledge for the 21st century, as I, I've heard it called. But anyway, um, he gives an argument there against kind of the classical foundationalist account that you would hold. And I think it's called his anti, anti-luminicity argument, if I hope I'm saying that correctly. And as I understand it, maybe you'll have a better understanding of it than I do. But as I understand it, he says that, you know, you could um, have like a visual experience of, uh, say, something, say like a red light that like slowly turns into an orange light. And but but you wouldn't, you might not know that it's changing. You might like even when it's more orange, you might yeah, still so think it's red or something like that. that. Maybe you can explain it better, but that's the, the, the gist of it. And anything is with okay, color, so, you know, having direct shape. acquaintance so with that fact once isn't going to buy into this is that it should your belief because you're not generalized know that it's almost changing. into all of your empirical knowledge. But it's infinite, just very small, infinitesimal changes. So small that moment by moment you couldn't tell the difference, but it is changing. Um, and let's say as you get to that middle range where you're almost orange, but you're still red, if you think that that, that color is still red, but there's going to be one infinitesimal moment when it suddenly changes. So there's, this is actually an assumption I'm okay with, but one of the assumptions in his argument is that there are facts of the matter about when one thing, when you have something that can be on this like gradual series when it's when it there's a fact of the matter when it stops being one and begins being the other. Um, so if you're for those that are familiar with these paradoxes of uh, they're called Sorites paradoxes, like uh, how many grains of sand does it take to heap upon one another till it changes from being a heap of sand? And if you were to do this for a very 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 long time, it would eventually become a mountain. Well. How many, what's the number of grains of sand that you need to turn that into a mountain? He would say there is some fact of the matter that makes it so. Um, you know, but the beer, there's a similar problem, uh, you know, that a lot of teenage boys know about, which is at what point does a, a few random bits of stubble turn into a beard? How many of those do you need? To, you know, and once again, He's going to say there's a fact of the matter that at a certain point or a certain length or a certain number or a certain density, it goes from just being stubble to becoming beard. Um, so there is on this argument, at some point, it will, in fact, stop being red and it will start being orange at this precise moment. But what would you believe? 
so, and it, for him, it actually doesn't seem to matter whether you think it is red or orange at that moment. The problem, he says, is that you are dangerously close to being wrong. So close because the changes are so subtle and happen so gradually that you might have made that exact same judgment and been wrong if it would have been the moment before or the moment after. Okay. So, so what is the problem here for... Uh, justification based on direct acquaintance. Well, the truth is, uh, one, I think that the, if, he, if, first of all, if he's successful at all, it would only be for these borderline cases. Pointing out that there are some of these really borderline type cases would not, would, would not really seem to impugn in any way the clear-cut paradigm non-borderline cases. So, um, so let's say he's right. Okay, I'm, I'm willing to say fine. Then just on a handful of kind of weird cases, maybe I'm not justified if he's correct. Um, another way that I reject this is that it, it really hinges a lot on this idea of, of actually an externalist assumption about justification called safety. And safety is, is often a, a condition of justification that externalists put in that say, your belief is justified if it's safe, by which they mean, if the circumstance, these circumstances are such that um, you would continue to believe this even, um, you believe it if it was true if, and the circumstances change slightly, or you would believe it if it was false when the circumstances change and it's false. Um, I think no, uh, no internalist really is obligated, at least, to hold to safety to the safety requirement. The idea that the belief is unsafe at any moment, you know, it could slightly change, and I might still hold on to it and be, and it would be false. If I'm believing it on these kind of intrinsic grounds of the good reasons that I have that I'm directly aware of, and it is true, um, it just seems like I've got. There, it, I don't see any reason to, to impugn uh, the justification that I have there. Um, so. I mean, I think those are some pretty big reasons, but I would also say, how many of us are going to continue to, to hold these, these beliefs in this way? I mean, we also apply other kinds of concepts to these things, like the concept of reddish orange, um, that as that thing moves through, we might start changing, you know, we have other concepts to capture those beliefs. And so we're not forced into this sort of position to, to always say it has to be red or it has to be orange. And I feel like even that's part of the way that this argument is set up. Um, we've got other concepts at our disposal and we do have concepts, I think, that do not have those perfect breaking points that he has. Like, um, you know, at this exact point, it goes from being a heap into a mountain or a bunch of stubble into a beard that we've got ideas like reddish orange that bleed over into both categories because we are directly acquainted with these experiences and we're aware of the fact that these things do in fact uh, kind of get into this vaguer uh, middle area. So, um, so I find that if there's any merit to the argument at all, it really has very limited scope, but I'm also inclined to reject uh, most of it anyway. Um, you know, I don't really know what, uh, what really stands of it when we start really looking at how we're, we're, we're forming our beliefs and, and in those circumstances. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. Uh, okay, so then kind of maybe transitioning a little bit towards uh, religious epistemology, uh, maybe you've established that this is a good theory of epistemic justification, right? It satisfies your subjective and your objective connection to reality, connection to truth there. Uh, so kind of what are the implications then for adopting this epistemology for our religious beliefs? Because, you know, there's a lot of concern out there that we've got really stringent, really tight um conditions on basic beliefs. And so, uh, I, like, I think Andrew Moon said uh, once that he doesn't <laughs> think that there's any way to get to beliefs about God, beliefs about the truth of Christianity, 
just going on direct acquaintances. Uh, and so this really seems to be a concern for a lot of people. I had somebody block me on Facebook just because I said that I didn't believe that uh, you could have a properly basic belief that God exists. Uh, and I don't think I was nasty about it either, right. but like, so this is a big deal it, to some so people. So the, the view they ends up being classified a way as a type of evidentialism. God, um, and evidentialism then is this these idea that your religious on beliefs so, um, hey, what are the there to be justified or, can or to count as knowledge need to be based on good reasons, on some evidence. Um, and this is, of course, a very unpopular view. Um, and I, I think that, that though, uh, the other, I often think the other way of looking at this, though, is really unpalatable if we really think about this. Uh, so for those that think that belief in God can be properly basic, it's this idea that you that you know fill that in and, not, and for planning and for many christians it's not just bare theism but like trinitarian christian evangelical biblical theology all these things are built into properly basic so and what they're saying is you you are justified in believing these things but without any reason whatsoever you are not it, you are not aware of any good reasons for holding it it is just the starting point um, so I find that fairly difficult. It's, this seems precisely like the kind of belief that the, the set of beliefs that should have good reasons behind them. And, and of course I am an evangelical Christian. I think that there are in fact very good reasons for, uh, believing the tenets of, of theology and the, the truths of the Bible and, and about the Bible that I hold to. Um, I don't take those to be properly basic. I take those to be inferred from the evidence. Now, uh, so, so that's the first thing I want to say is that we wouldn't, when we encounter people from other religions, for instance, uh, once again, speaking to my brethren that are other Christians here, we wouldn't, we don't allow them to just say that their beliefs are properly basic. Uh, in fact, our, first, what we try to do is quickly get them to think about, do you really have good reasons to think that book of Mormon was inspired or that, uh, you know, Islam is true or that Hinduism and, you know, gives you enlightenment. Like, these are all things that, that we would say, man, why would you believe that without good reason? It's, these seem like just the sorts of things you need reasons to believe. And what's good for the goose is good for the gander. And um, I think that Christianity makes just the sorts of claims that need evidence to be justified. But I also sincerely and, and genuinely believe that, that Christianity has the goods to say we've got good evidence for making those claims and that these are justified beliefs. Indeed, they, I believe they arrive to the standard of knowledge. So, um, so I think that, that religious epistemology, as a result of my view, ends up being uh, those beliefs that make up our theology need to be inferred, and they need to be inferred from, from good grounds if they're going to be justified and, and stand as evidence. Uh, and I think this makes a lot of sense, too, because for the most part, well, when we get to our distinctive religious beliefs, uh, they actually don't arrive just out of nowhere as a basic belief. They actually uh, come from somewhere. And whether we read our Bibles and found them, well, if you got, if you arrived at this belief by reading, then you were relying upon sense perception and sense experiences, which means that actually your knowledge of the Bible was not basic, but inferred from those experiences. If uh, you have a particular brand of theology or, or a particular school of theology that, that you say is properly basic, well, you actually didn't start off with those beliefs, but those beliefs were acquired once again through other epistemic routes, maybe through being taught and listening and seeing, um, once again relying upon other epistemic uh, modes of believing for, for acquiring those beliefs. So it would just once again seem like that these things really are not the grant at the ground level as pious as it sounds to say belief in God is properly basic. Uh, it's really not the sort of thing that, that when you really think about it seems at all properly basic. Uh, it seems like the kind of belief that we arrive at through um, a series of inferences and other sources and, and reliance upon other, uh, other uh, epistemic uh, epistemic practices and, and methods. So, um, yeah, to me, as, as 
as unpious as it may sound when put up against its contenders, it does have the ring of truth to it when you start to really think about what it means to say that uh, our religious beliefs that Christianity is not properly basic, that it is inferred. Yeah, and it just makes me think of like Paul's words in Romans ten fourteen, right? He says, how shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Like, it doesn't sound to me like the authors of scripture thought that, oh, well, you know, it's just a properly basic belief that people will have with mm -hmm. properly functioning cognitive faculties or something like that. It very much seems to me that there was this... Uh, urgency to, to tell people because they had to hear it in order to believe it not that it could be something that was properly basic um even though and one other thought i had on that is that it seems like mormons offer more justification for believing the book of mormon than that I like this is they one say of you gotta have some kind of burning in the bosom or something when you read either the book of mormon on um it seems to me if you adopt that you like, get planting a subjective view, you don't even get that you get no that is justifying justification your belief and it is not whatsoever. that at all he is not saying that you have some kind of subjective religious experience that is the basis that you then base your religious beliefs on that would be inferential he is saying something much more like Norman the Clairvoyant that I talked about earlier, where it just pops into your head suddenly, you know, God exists. Jesus is the Son of God. The Holy Spirit is part of the Trinity. But if you were to ask the, the person on The View, do you have good reasons for that? Like, why do you believe that? They would say, um, no, I have no good reason to believe that. I have no basis for this. It just strikes me as being true. That's that really is the kind of approach that Plantinga is advocating is that if, if God caused you to have those beliefs in the right way and you have, happen to have no defeaters, no reason to disbelieve them, then, hey, that counts as, as uh, he called warrant, that you are warranted in holding those things and would be true. And, and when they're true, would count as knowledge. Uh, and that seems to me just like saying, like, well, Norman would know that the president is in New York City if it was just caused in the right way, even if he has no inkling whatsoever uh, as to why it's true. Um, and a really telling thing, and you can get this online for free, the, the, there's a an online, great online resource for uh, actually older Christian texts called the Christian classic ethereal library, I believe. I think it's ccel.org, maybe. But uh, Alvin Plantinga's warranted Christian belief is on there um, for free. Like, I think he purchased the copyright um, and it is on there legally and for free. Read the last paragraph of his book where he talks about, um, is Christianity warranted? And to pretty much says, I can't, as a philosopher, I, I'm not equipped or able to answer that question. Um, you know, it feels like it is to me, but that's not me speaking as a philosopher. It's just me, you know, speaking as a, you know, as a Christian and as a person. To me, that's a terrible, a, a terrible letdown for a whole book about is Christian, is the, the Christian faith uh, warranted? Is it, does it meet the standard of, you know, of, of epistemology to end it with? I don't know. I hope so. And, uh, you know, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. So, uh, it does not, the way that I like to put this, doesn't give you blessed assurance. Um, it, it says, if all these conditions are met, and we can't know if they're met, by the way, but if they were all met and our beliefs were produced by God in just this right way, well, then it's good. But if you said, well, did God produce it? Can I know that he did this? Is it, is it in fact this way? I don't know. We, we're, nobody can know. We're, we're never in a position to, do, to tell that. And to me, uh, that's just terribly dissatisfying. And if I were trying to find, uh, if I were assessing my own religious views, and that was the best I could say, I would say that it's a, it's a big letdown in trying to assess are my own religious beliefs warranted or justified or knowledge. You, you just are not in a position to say. Yeah, and in the last paragraph of your, uh, I believe it was your response to Tyler McNabb in your book with him, I, just, I loved the last paragraph of it. You were like, 
ultimately the best reformed epistemology is able to do is to say that w when someone asks if their beliefs are their religious beliefs are appropriately held is that they are if a host of other conditions are met that are beyond the person's own ascertaining that's not blessed assurance or this is hardly blessed assurance or something like that and it, it was a, it was a great way at least you know for me because i mean it just I'm not comfortable with just effectively assuming that my beliefs, my religious beliefs are true and, you know, hopefully they were reliably produced. Uh, one last question then, uh, just by way of resources for viewers who maybe want to go out and study this some more, yeah, uh, the link in the description, think, I'm going to, of course, have a, great place a, to start a link to your website the, where people can find debating, uh, your writings uh, the there, of God your book, book which, uh, as I said, um, is a great place to explore this debate, five, but are, are there any other resources book. that you would recommend? I can't remember what the title is. Uh, about five views of Christian, I think it's like Christianity and philosophy. And it has a lot of these same themes that come up in it. Um, I would, I, my view would be closely aligned with uh, Dr. Timothy McGrew, who is a contributor to that. Um, and so that, that would be another really good resource to check out. Um, I think that one of, just my advice to those that really get interested in religious epistemology is not to make the same mistake that I made. So when I started, I tried to understand epistemology, religious epistemology independent of epistemology, period. So uh, as an undergraduate, it may surprise people to find out I was a diehard uh, advocate of reformed epistemology, that I thought Alvin Plantinga had all the answers. And why was that? It was because I wasn't actually thinking about what is the best way to do epistemology. I was trying to say, what is the best way for me to rationalize the truth, of the standing of Christianity epistemically? And I was basically handed his works and, and told, here is the, the leading Christian writing about these topics and was essentially encouraged to just adopt this without question because he was a Christian and therefore that made it right. Um, it took me several years and of reflection on this epistemology to realize, and, and I would say part of that was several years of taking courses in epistemology proper to begin to realize what was really going on with the view and realizing it wasn't delivering what I thought it was delivering. It was not actually providing uh, a, a way to say that people have good reasons to believe in Christianity. It was a way to try to say, if you don't have good reasons, we can find a way to, to call that warrant or, or something like that. But don't, you know, in, in a way, of many many folks who have adopted planning as approach, uh, I think one of the reasons they actually like it is because it allows them to comfortably say there are no good reasons to believe in Christianity. So they don't have to actually engage with, with those reasons with unbelievers. But at the same time, um, I'm still in good epistemic standing. It's still a re respectable belief to hold, even though I don't have any good reason whatsoever to, to believe it. So um, I think that the by thinking just once, much more clearly about the nature of epistemology itself, and there are a lot of really good uh, epistemology books. Um, Richard Thummerton and Lawrence Bonjour have both written um, kind of introductory books to epistemology that I highly recommend. Um, if you're wanting to go a little step further on this, uh, a nice introductory essay on foundationalism is Timothy McGrew's uh, little essay called A Defense of Strong Foundationalism. It uh, is so clear and easy to read and concise and it's, it's wonderful. For those of you that worry about the problem of skepticism, just read that one as a starting place. Uh, I think that, that you'll find that it is engaging and provides a lot of answers. So um, I don't want to keep going on, but but my advice for a lot of the those doing this is, once again, take, don't try to just do religious epistemology. Try to do epistemology proper and then see how uh, religious epistemology fits now that you understand how epistemology in general works. Yeah, and I can't agree with that more strongly. My understanding of epistemology, religious epistemology, was just enhanced by growing my knowledge of 
epistemology in general. Yeah, thanks for uh, having Dr. me. Dr. Poe, thank you so it. much I hope, for, uh, didn't bore I, everyone you know, I know we went a little bit over, uh, but thank you so much I, for giving us I've been told from my students that I'm quite, uh, my voice is, really is quite good, good at being interview, able to sleep, uh, your so I appreciate those who made it to the end. Thank you so much for coming on. If anyone's watching this, it probably means that they're like the, a philosophy and apologetics nerd. So I'm sure they were entertained. Uh, if you enjoyed the, you know, if you enjoyed this Thank interview, you. then yeah, please consider liking the video, uh, consider subscribing to the channel, and uh, sharing the video as well, just uh, t for people who are interested in this topic to watch.